So I feel very lucky to be working on this project. There aren't a lot of places in the world where you can be in a mega city of over 10 million people and live alongside large carnivores. In fact, there are two. One of them is Mumbai and one of them is Los Angeles here with our mountain lions. So mountain lions as a species are generally doing okay, but there are a number of populations, especially here in California, that are really highly at risk of extinction. And that's because of low genetic diversity and gene flow. So for example, here, I'm currently at a Stunt Ranch within the Santa Monica Mountains, a UCLA reserve. And this population here is hemmed in by huge amounts of urban area, as well as very large freeways. We've been studying carnivores in general for 26 years now, actually. So we started the carnivore project in 1996, actually even before I came. And the goal of the project in general is to understand the impacts of urbanization and fragmentation on wildlife. So we're, we're here in this national park in the second largest metropolitan area in the country. And so all the work we do really is focused on understanding what is it like for these animals to live in such an urban landscape? This is where our story begins, really, in about 2018, when we have an area that's roughly equivalent to one to two adult male home ranges but upwards of eight males living in there. And of course, uh, they're prevented from dispersing or dispersal is made more difficult by all of these urban barriers. So at this time, in November 2018, we see a large fire. Fire is a normal part of Mediterranean ecosystems, certainly. But unfortunately, the frequency of fire has been increasing significantly, and it's way higher than it naturally should be in these Mediterranean sort of scrubland ecosystems. But also, we're getting really huge fires, uh, and that was the case with the Woolsey fire. Just there was just the massive central sort of central western part of Santa Monica's was just completely devoid of vegetation. Like it was not just a big fire, but a very intense fire that just created this moonscape, basically. Now, when you take half the mountain lion habitat and turn it into a moonscape, this is a pretty big problem for this species for a number of reasons. Number one, they're solitary and territorial. So they need to move around without being seen by other mountain lions, especially when there are quite a lot of them in this area. Also, they're shy of humans and human structures. So they like to move around in cover without being seen by humans. And of course, finally, their predominant prey item is mule deer. And they capture these prey by ambush. So they need cover to be able to stalk and successfully hunt their prey. So these are our GPS radio collars that we place on mount lions. Um, we have them programmed to take eight locations a day. So every two hours at night from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. And then one daytime location at 2 p.m. Another cool thing about these collars is that they record activity um, on two axes every five minutes. And so we can get a lot of detailed information about what that cat is doing. So in this case, we had lots of mountain lions we were tracking before the fire and then after the fire. So that's really been cool. So it's really exciting to be able to look at that and, and do some more detailed analysis of that. Um, I mean, I think one of the important things is just to actually document what we sort of expected, but, um, but it was good to see it in the data was that the, the mountain lions just stopped using or significantly reduced their use of the area post burn. And, you know, that's makes sense because it's, it's all burned up, but it's, it's good to actually be able to show that 
with the data. But then it was really interesting in this paper to look in at some more detailed aspects of their behavior, and in particular behaviors that might put them at risk in various ways, both in terms of risk with humans and risk with other animals of their species that they might have conflicts with. P64, who was really interesting, he learned to cross two freeways actually, which is kind of a big deal, especially 101. During the fire, he was in the Simi Hills actually, and he presumably to try to escape from the fire, he was going south towards developed areas and then turned around and went back across the recently burned area. And two weeks later, he died from starvation, essentially loss of condition. And his paws were badly burned, so um, he basically died as a result of the fire. So how did it turn out? Were they taking more risks around humans and urban environments or more risks around encountering other mountain lions? How did they trade this off? Well, it turns out that they took more risks with regards to both of those factors. So we saw an increase in road crossings from around three crossings per month to about five crossings per month after fire. And also in terms of freeways, as an example, the 101 freeway, which is a 10 lane freeway, just right through the center of their whole habitat area. They cross that generally once every two years in the 16 years prior to the fire. And then in the 15 months of our study past the fire, we saw them cross it about once every four months. So the road crossings definitely increased. Um, we also saw an increase in daytime activity from about 10% of the day to about 16% of the day after fire. And what was interesting and a little surprising to some people was we really didn't see much change at all in use of urban areas. Before the fire, they used urban areas a really small proportion of the time, about 5% of the time. And then after the fire, it was pretty similar. So these landscapes remain a really strong deterrent to mountain lions, which I think is good news for a lot of people that have a little bit of fear around them coming to take their pets. So what these types of populations of large carnivores that are experiencing multiple disturbances need is more connectivity. And that's going to help promote gene flow and it's also going to allow them to move freely between and among dynamic landscapes that are influenced by multiple disturbances. So a really big step in the right direction for this population is the Wallace Annenberg Wildlife Crossing. So we just broke ground this year at Liberty Canyon and it's going to cross the 10 lane freeway known as the 101 and will be completed by 2025. It's going to be the world's largest wildlife crossing and it's going to help not only mountain lions but also the range of biodiversity in this Mediterranean hotspot we know as Los Angeles.